Okay. All right, terrific. Okay, good. So, uh, so hopefully you received the updated schedule. There was some clarification that we needed to do on your schedule of due dates. So I went ahead and did that and sent it out to you and posted a new one at the top of Moodle. So if you have not looked at that, please, please look at it. Uh, let me go over a few highlighted elements here. The first one is your video of this speech needs to be uploaded by September 6th, okay, before 11 o'clock p.m. on um, September 6th. That will enable, enable your classmates to watch your videos, all right? So you're actually uploading them in what's called the forum layout, which means then that all of you will need to look at at least two, but hopefully you're going to be looking at everybody's. And then based on that, you'll select two that you want to do a critique on, okay? And that critique is going to be based on the rubric uh, which is posted in the assignment for where you upload the videos. And uh, I want to go through that for just a moment. So if you want to go there also, um, you can. Otherwise, just know that it's all, this is, I'm going straight off of something that's actually on your uh, Moodle course. OK, so you're going to select one classmate. Hopefully, you'll pick somebody that may be in, in the different sections so that we can start to get to know each other. All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to write two paragraphs, all right? So um, let's say it is peer number one, and then you're going to do peer number two, all right? Now, you're going to get credit just by uploading your own video. So the first um, grading criteria is, did you submit your own MP4 or um, iPhone um, Connect or your YouTube um, URL? Did you do that on time? That's 10 points right there. Then you've got two classmates. Now, what you need to do is to demonstrate your understanding of what you've learned in the class so far. That could be about... Aristotle, ethos and pathos, that could be about um, Plato's and, you know, search of the truth. It might be something about um, honesty and integrity and your credibility. Uh, it could be about um, uh, organization of content, uh, coming up with an interesting um, organizational structure that is easy to follow and you know a preview is given so it might be something on the rubric who knows all right but you are going to be analyzing it now in paragraph number one for the first peer what you're going to do is identify three really good things that the speaker did three really good qualities about either the content and or the actual delivery, okay? So you want to help your peer feel good. So this is going to bring a smile on your classmate's face, all right? Then you're also going to, in a second paragraph, identify one opportunity for development. And Again, it might be what well, maybe they didn't speak very loudly. Maybe they need to um, dress for the occasion. Maybe they need to slide their notes more quietly. Um, any of the things that we talk about up to this point, as well as what we're going to talk about today and next class, can, are all fair game for what you're going to talk about in this paragraph. So this is going to cause your... Uh, a classmate to go, hmm, I gotta think about that. All right, that means that your class 
may, may agree with you and may not. It's okay, all right? But what they're going to be doing is take your constructive feedback, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, how you gave it, with, I really need to think about that. And good feedback. Or, hmm, I don't quite agree with that, but thank you anyway. Okay, so that's what they're thinking inside their brain when they're reading uh, the constructive feedback. All right, now what you're going to have to do though is to support your claim. All right, so we're really getting into attributions and references. So let's say you've identified with your classmate that the person needs to use more gestures. Maybe the person needs to be careful about the scenery and follow the pause that's explained in the module for how to set it up and how do you look for your background and everything for doing a speech on, on video. Um, and maybe the person also needs to uh, um, have a have a, a really, really good, or actually maybe they, these are all positive, excuse me. This person, sorry, 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 positive. This person has great gestures. This person has a beautiful setting background. So they clearly follow the pause guideline. And they also had a wonderful, memorable thought that made you think, well, it was a really good speech, okay? But they had one thing that they need to improve on, okay? So you're going to need to substantiate it, cite the source, all right? And here what you're going to say is, well, maybe the person needs to uh, slide notes quietly. Okay, now, this is the information. Now you gotta cite your source. In the parentheses, after you say something, you say where you got that from. So if it's gestures, you could say lecture 831 in parentheses after that. Pause. You could say Moodle handout. For the memorable thought, maybe it is um, rubric or outline. All right. So that you are continuing to coach your classmate on where they can go to look for the backup source information for what you're giving them. If they need to look at the slide their notes a little bit more quietly, again, maybe that is something that was given in a lecture at 831. All right, so the person will know to go back and watch the video that was instructed for that lecture. Okay, so that's really important. All right, did that make sense? And you're gonna do that times two. Oops, that's the times. So you're gonna do it for um, another peer as well, okay? So that's what it says here on the grading rubric when it says you can demonstrate understanding of the readings and the lectures by correctly using and applying the terms and the theories and the practices that are being taught to you in the course. This is the way how we internalize what we're learning. This is how we make it really stick and become a part of who we are. Okay, um, page number of references or lectures or handout references, etc. cetera. Two complete paragraphs, proper grammar rules, spelling, punctuation, etc. cetera. And 25 points for your tone. All right, so let's talk about tone for a moment. Tone refers to that civil discourse, especially when you're using constructive feedback. 
So if you are wanting help in how to make sure that you are giving uh, some tough feedback for somebody to hear, then you'll want to go back up into the orientation, all right, and watch that video um, by Mr. Paltrow because that gives you some really good techniques for how you can speak um, politely and mindfully. And um, let's see, the words I say are civilly, respectfully, kindly, and meaningfully um, in how you're writing. All right. So that's what you're going to do for the critiquing of the peers. So let me go over here and look at the students. Do you have any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, if you think about it, this is what we need to do as audience members. This is all about being an audience member. This is about being an effective listener to what somebody is saying. And so that you can critique both the delivery, but also you can be, more importantly, probably, is delivering the content. And you're going to see how important this is as we move into more sophisticated speeches later in the class. To help you in this, um, you can look at chapter 14 in your textbook, um, which talks about listening skills. What does it mean to be a good listener? What does it mean to be a fair and just listener? Uh, sometimes we even have to check our biases. Remember when I did that process model? You know, uh, are you making comments about the way somebody speaks because just culturally they're different from you? Maybe how they speak is who they are, and that's all right. Um, so maybe you don't want to do a criticism of that. That could be where somebody may say, um, you know, hmm, I need to think about that. I'm not sure if I'm going to accept that. All right, and that's okay. You see, you don't have to agree with criticism. You have to be open to hearing it. But you might say, thank you. I'll think about that. Or, you know, I think we're going to have to disagree, maybe agree to disagree on that one. And that's civil discourse, right? All right, and if you have any questions as you were doing that, let me know. Okay, now the next thing is on the 13th is your peer assessment, um, excuse me, your personal assessment of your skills and knowledge. This is your baseline. This is now that we've had about two, three weeks of class time, uh, you've learned a lot, a lot. It's very intense at first. Uh, you have put it into practice. You have watched yourself on video, which we never like to do. We hate our voices and that kind of stuff. You have been able to watch other classmates and how they did their speech. So you could do some comparisons. Uh, what you may have done better or what you could take from what their technique was and use in your next speech yourself. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on. So with this, we're creating a baseline. Here's where your skills and your knowledge are as of September 13th. Then you're going to do the same thing as a post-assessment after your speech in December and you're going to see how much you have improved, and you're going to go like, whoa, what a great class, Miss Kay is awesome. But it's actually you who made all the effort, okay? So that's due on the 13th. Now I also gave you, I sent to you uh, another activity, and this I sent to you in an email, so you'll need to read the email, uh, or in the announcements, you can find it as well. And it's an extra credit opportunity for five points that you can have put to any assignment in module one that you want. It could be an assignment that you missed, or maybe you don't like your grade on your test, excuse me, on your speech or an outline. And since those are worth 60% of your grade, I think 40%, the most part of your grade, you may want to have this extra credit applied to that. 
So what I'd like for you to do is to watch a video that is the virtual resource fair that was developed by the Effective Communication Association. And by watching that, I want you to answer three questions. You're going to answer those three questions by sending me an email. And in that email, you're just going to answer the three questions. You'll notice that one of those questions is an invitation for a critique. Uh, so again, you're going to follow the same kind of language that you're using in giving constructive, helpful, respectful, mindful suggestions for improvement the next time this is done. Uh, but you're also going to be looking at it for information that's going to help you. All right, so there's three questions. Questions number one is, what information did you learn about resources that are provided that you did not know about before? And number two, what resource was showcased that you really could use the help in right now? You really could use that help right now. And who was the contact person and what are you gonna to do to get in contact with that person to get that assistance? And then the third question is to give constructive feedback. Okay, extra credit on the 13th. All right. So those are some opportunities for you. It's really hard not to get an A in this class. I'm gonna give you lots of extra credit opportunities, lots of second chances, um, but not accept late work, right? Okay, so let's go into specific feedback about your outlines. Okay, uh, uh, I want some of you are confused about general and specific purpose. General purpose is going to be really one word. Entertain. Or or it might be to capture uh, or you know whatever. But it's one word. It's usually just entertain, inform, or persuade. That's it. Your specific purpose then is diving down into more specifics. All right. So you're going to um, make audience at funeral not sad. Okay. Hopefully, try to make. Okay, that's your specific purpose. Or it might be a specific purpose might be to celebrate a life well lived. Okay, it's a lot more specific than just to entertain. All right, now your thesis statements, everybody. Clarification. When I say you have to have your thesis twice, it means that you have it in the top portion before you get into your introduction, thesis statement, All right? And then you're going to have your visual aids and then you're going to have your stage directions. That's the first time you have your thesis statement. The second time you have it is in the introduction. Now, some of you may call it reveal topic, some of you may call it thesis statement, some of you may call it central idea. I don't care what you call it, all of those will be acceptable, but just make sure you have it also in the introduction, but not two times in the introduction, just once. Okay, also, A preview is different from a thesis. All right, so let's look at it, an intro for a moment. So we have an intro, and then we have the body of a speech, and then we have the conclusion, and then we have references. Okay, so intro, body, conclusion, references. Now, in your body, everything must have a label. I really recommend that you keep it short, 
Some of you have a whole lot of words for your labels. You don't need that. You can just take it straight from the uh, rubric. Uh, but keep it short, and I would make it bold so that you know you're not going to be reading that out loud. Right? So you may have revealed topic or thesis statement, however you want to say it, and that's what you're going to do. But the preview might be attached to that or not. Sometimes it's better to have it not attached. Remember that the preview is where you tell, you tell the audience what are the main, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, thesis statement and then the preview. You're going to tell the audience the main points, okay? That's your preview. It's like a table of contents, right? So you are pre-telling what's going to be explained in the body of the speech, right? Um, for this short speech, it might be just two main points. That's fine. But you got to have at least two, not just one, all right? So then you're going to have your main point one and main point two. You don't have to do label for sub point or sub sub point. You don't have to do those labels. That's just like craziness. But a main point one and a main point two is always helpful. Make sure that everything under your main points are indented. All right, so you're going to be indenting. And when you are doing your conclusion, then in your summary or review, it's just quickly repeating the main points. So here's the formula for public speaking. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And then I'm going to tell you. And then I'm going to review what I just told you. That's good public speaking. It's not political kind of public speaking. That's what you do when you, this is good public speaking that you're doing for the kind that we're teaching you, right? And then you have your references. Okay. Remember, you got to have a transition between here. I recommend that you put it in bold and italics. Same thing here. Transition. Guide your audience from the body into the conclusion. To guide your audience from the intro into the body. And then here, you need to have a signpost between main points. Okay. And a signpost should be italicized and labeled. You need labels, 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 um, bold, italicized. Giving visual, consistent cues to your mind's eye of what you're doing in your script. Okay. Now, the references. I want to talk about what we call attributions. In this speech, remember I said you needed at least one. Um, in later speeches, you're going to need more than that. Uh, in your next speech, you should have at least two or three. I would say at least three. Okay. Um, and your speeches after that, you're going to need at least five um, and even up to seven. So we're starting off small so that you're learning how to do it, and then it becomes pretty easy. Right? If you list something in your reference, you got to somehow put it in your outline. Right? You don't just, it's not like a, a research paper where the information is just there. No, you need to actually put it in. Okay. So let's say that you are going to use a, um, oh, somebody did a great speech about um, a 
great grandmother's uh, cookbook. All right. So you have down here the actual cookbook. All right. And you give all the information to, you know, about the cookbook, just like you would do it for anything, APA format. All right. Even if it's, if there's a way to do that by going to the OWL at Purdue, it'll show you how to do if it's just even a, you know, handwritten cookbook. Okay. But so here's this cookbook, you know, with all the information in APA format. And then if it's mentioned at main point two, that here are some of the best recipes in this book, then it's the same thing where you're going to then give an attribution, means you're going to attribute the information to a source, okay? So the recipe might be on, um, so let's say, so my, Great grandma's recipe for um, cobbler is located on page 66 of this cookbook. All right. Now, that then says what are the three elements for attributions, okay? And on your outline, it says under the body, I usually put it there because that's usually where it's found, but sometimes people will do it in a conclusion or in an introduction in terms of at least one source. Okay, but here's what you have. You need to tell who is the author, where, did you find it? And when was it stated or written? So here we would say my great grandma's um, recipe that was printed in the 1920s okay, has the best peach cobbler recipe in the whole world on page 66. And if you've never had it, you got to try it. So those are the who, where, and whens. It says on your paper, um, according to, that's the who. Published in, that's the actual cookbook. When, in the 1920s. Now, if you are doing research later and you are pulling up something from the internet, you know, so let's say you say, you know, um, dog is man's best friend, all right? Well, that's according to brainy quotes that I, brainy quotes, that I looked up on the internet on their website yesterday. That's the who, where, and when. And that's all we mean by attribution. It's not any more complicated than that. It's just making sure that you give credit to a source for information that you don't own. All right. Let me go back over and look. All right, so does that start to make sense a little bit more, everybody? Yeah, yeah, okay, good, good. Um, some of you, I want to draw your attention to um, a greater degree of creativity. Now, you and I both know that you have watched some pretty boring instructors and speakers well here's the way i used to when i was teaching um, i was actually teaching uh, in a catholic school in oakland california and i was teaching morality 
And it was a very diverse school that had, we had students who were Sikh Muslims, uh, many, many um, Buddhists, uh, some evangelical Christians, obviously a lot of Catholic Christians, and a lot of people who were nothing, all right? So my job was to talk about a couple of tough sub subjects. So one of my subjects was to talk about responsible sex. Yes. So here is a, how I would always start it. Now, back in those days, the Center for Disease Control was a pretty uh, reliable source. Sometimes today we're a little questionable. But what I would do is on that day, is I would say, hi, guess what? I just looked up in uh, online today, this morning, actually while I was drinking my coffee at the Center for Disease Control and their latest statistics. And what I read shocked me. It actually says that eight out of every 20 high school graduates will graduate with more than a diploma. They also graduate sexually transmitted disease. Now let's do the math. Let's look around the classroom right now. We have about 22 students. So that tells me that about eight of you are going to have an STD when you graduate from the school. Do you want to be that statistic? I bet not. So listen up, and I'm going to tell you what you need to do in this class. And I'm not going to talk just about abstinence. Okay? So would you be interested in that class after that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I grab your attention? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, exactly. I so that's grabbing the attention of your audience. That's not. May I have your attention, please? No, no. What you want to do is you want to use a startling statistic, maybe a very famous quote. Maybe if you're talking about your best friend, a motto that the two of you always lived by. Um, maybe it was a line from um, the dumbest movie in the whole world. Um, and But you, when you saw each other, you'd say it, you'd burst out laughing, and that was the thing that you always talked about. Who knows what it is? But you got to bring in some element of gotcha, you know, to get people to really want to listen to you. That's your attention getter. So that means then that when you get to the end of your talk, you got to have a memorable thought or a call to action, sometimes both. So when I would wrap that class session up, I would literally do the same thing. I do the pregnant pause. Look at me. So some of you are squirming in your seats right now because of what you may have been doing or what you're thinking about doing or what you're looking forward to doing. Let's end today with a thought for you. You've got lots of good information here. Which statistic do you want to be? That eight or that five when you graduate? Class dismissed. Okay, do you see? <laughs> Wrap it up. That's when your memorable thoughts should be connected somehow to your attention getter. So you start to kind of like wrap up the entire speech. 
Um, so if you're talking about the celebration of a life, then you're going to end with the celebration of the life. Um, if you're going to start with something awesome, end with something awesome. If you're going to start with something profound, end with something profound. So uh, these are the things that I, I want you to be thinking about how you can make your speeches interesting from the beginning as well as at the end. The research tells us that your audience is going to remember the first minute of what you say and the last minute of what you say far longer than anything else in the middle. That's when you've captivated them at the beginning. That's when you got their attention. And when they know you're wrapping up, that's when they start to pay attention again. So use that valuable time to your advantage. So I want you, um, nearly all of you need to work on your memorable thoughts and attention getters. Uh, let's see. A lot of just mechanical things. You know, you've got to label, label, label. Um, add some more creativity for a bunch of you guys. And you need at least one source, et cetera. All right. Okay, so I'm going to put these here. Let me walk over here. Any questions as I look into the camera, the classroom? Question. Um, can you give just a couple more examples of the sub points or like sub transitions between the points of the body paragraph? Yeah, so the ones that we talked, the signposts? Yes. Okay, a signpost. Um, here's an example. So now that I've told you about her travels, let's look at some of her accomplishments. All right, see? It's a bridge. You're doing a bridge. Or, um, well, first, you know, okay. So now let me go into my second main point. Or now let's talk about, now that you've heard about um, the problem, let's take a real good look at the solutions. Right? Yeah, so you're just bridging. You're just helping people go from one point to the next. That's a really good question. And it's going to be different. You know, it might be and three. Okay, so you said first was your transition, and now you're in the speech, and now you're a signpost. All right, so that was one. So now two. Okay. Anybody else have another question? I love when you ask questions. All right, so um, I'm going to begin talking a little bit. Um, we, most of our time is gone. So this class and next class, uh, Wednesday's class, is going to be um, very, very heavy about uh, delivery. All right, so and I've been giving you some techniques all the way through. I want you to be sure to read the pause handout. P-A-W-S, all right? Oftentimes, you're setting the background of where you are recording your speech could be problematic. So just keep that in mind. I, I, last semester, I had to tell a young woman to make her bed before the other students came on to the Zoom call, okay? Don't, don't be tacky. No tray tech A, all right? So keep that in mind. Uh, actually, I had to tell her to also close her drawers in her cupboards, uh, her chest, and uh, it was nightmare. Uh, okay. What in the world do you do with your hands? All right, so I'm going to start with that. There are what we call home positions for your hands. This is my favorite, actually. This is the Oprah Winfrey fingertip touch. Another is to have your arms down uh, at your sides. Another might be if you are standing behind a counter or behind a podium is like a little fingertip touch, little fingertip touch on the rim. Um, but what you want is for your hands to be able to go ahead and make some gestures. You don't want to be just a talking head, 
That's boring. So gestures are gonna be important. Changing your body a little bit, you know, changing how you look, how you stand. All of that is part of your stage directions and choreography. Uh, some of it is very planned, some of it is not. You'll notice that for hands, I will, uh, you know, put my hands up. I will refer to a document when I am looking at my notes. And if you use note cards, don't slide them loudly. All right? Don't do that. Your notes should be looked at and manipulated or used as quietly as possible. I recommend, uh, you know, if I had a podium, I would be using a podium and I would just do a slide, a quiet, so that nobody would hear me slide. Uh, so that's something you can use for your hands is also is your notes. Your hands should make pictures and emphasize key points or be directional, like remembering something from the past or looking at something that you're considering in the horizon in the future. So think of it as your hands are a visual aid. They are tools that you can use. And I'm going to end by talking about the face. The face is a critically important visual aid, especially the eyebrows and the mouth. Eyebrows and mouth. If any of you can raise one eyebrow higher than the other, that's really cool. I never could do that, but that always has one of those looks that you can oftentimes give that could be interesting. Uh, you, you know, a smile means a lot, uh, but sometimes, you know, the, the scrunched eyebrows, just think of happy faces or emoticons and how they can be so expressive by what you do with, you know, pursing your lips or, all right, so kind of think about all those things. And then of course, how you move your head. So all of those are visual aids. They need to go in concert with what you're saying. And that's it for today. We'll pick up on a lot more about that tomorrow, um, next class. So make sure you watch that video because we're going to talk a lot about it. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome. You guys are doing great. <laughs> Thank you.